And now coming up next, we'll talk about Web3 UX. So there are two questions to answer for this section. Why Web3 UX is horrible and how to fix it? So the presenter today, we are happy to have Phil. He's a product designer and ex-founder working on making Web3 easier to use for everyone through his work at Airfoil. Airfoil has worked on more than 90 crypto and fintech products, grow their team to more than 60 creatives, and helped design products that underpin the Web3 ecosystem for millions. Now, Phil will speak about his own experiences on how to get the foundation right with Web3 UX, a critical factor to making Web3 application more friendly to the mass. So please join your hands together to welcome Phil. Hello, everybody. Good to see everybody here. My name is Phil Hediatnia. Um, I started a company called Airfoil. Um, as uh, mentioned before, we've designed a lot of products across the crypto industry, including a few you may have used from Solana Pay to Drift Protocol, Bonfita, Utopia, Magna, Friction, um, and a bunch more. Um, but I'm here today to talk about design. Um, so I want to start by saying, who here in the room is a product designer? Raise your hand. OK, there's some, there's some hands. It's interesting. Well, Trung, we, we work together. It doesn't count. <laughs> but um, I wanted to make sure that this session was also fully responsive to everybody here and that everybody here could walk away with something that's applicable to what it is that they're building. Um, so we have a URL up there, airfull.link slash QA. If you open that right now in your browser, you can drop in some questions. There'll be time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, and I'll try to get to everything I can. But if not, please connect with me on Telegram or email, and, and we can chat more from there. So um, I actually want to start with this. Um, I don't know if everybody knows this YouTuber. It's a guy named PPP Peter, who I really love. And he's normally known for content like, I went to the cockroach-infested hotel in Moldova. I went to uh, you know, uh, the worst reviewed hotel um, in a given place. But he decided to go somewhere different this time. He actually went to the country of El Salvador. And the reason he went there is that he heard that the Salvadoran government had made Bitcoin legal tender. So hypothetically, this is a great place to start using crypto on a regular basis because the government recognizes it. The government encourages businesses to use it. The government even made its own uh, Bitcoin wallet called Chivo so that people could easily use it within the country. But when he actually got there, what he saw was very different. Is it possible to pay with Bitcoin here? Shakes head. I have Chivo, but I somehow closed my account and I don't know how to open it. Unfortunately, that was the reality on the ground. He could only make two or three transactions by the end of a three-day journey. If this is the experience that people have with cryptocurrency, then it's difficult for us to actually build the future that we want to build. And that's the reason I'm here. I'm here because one month ago in Singapore, I went over to the Raffles Hotel where there's an NFT gallery. And this is an actual photo of the instructions on how to get a wallet and get an airdrop. And there's one thing that may be a little tough to hear, but at the very bottom, that last sentence there, it says that in order to get the airdrop, go to a website, send them your wallet address via email, and then they'll airdrop you a free NFT. So these are all experiences we've got to make drastically, drastically better. I think that one misconception about design is that it's about taking product specs and turning them into mock-ups on Figma. But in reality, design is about psychology. It's about understanding what's going on in the head of the person who's using your product, anticipating it, and making changes to the visuals, to the copy, to everything that you're putting together um, to make sure that they feel supported as they go through. And so design isn't necessarily about visuals. It's more of a process. Anybody can think like a designer. And I think we all have to to build the future that we want to build. So today, I want to talk about three key things, how to convince users, how to communicate to users, and how to convert users to becoming successful users of your application. And of course, on that, there's going to be a bunch more points that I'll also refresh at the end of the presentation. This is what I'm going to run through today. But it's all those three things, convince, communicate, and convert. So let's start with convince. The first step, explain the real problem that you're solving. This is something that is not done nearly enough, but it's a really important point. So there's a speaker named Simon Sinek. He has this great TED talk called How Great Leaders Inspire Action. And he introduces a concept called the golden circle the why, the how, and the what. And this is the example that he basically gives. He says that 
the way most computer companies sell a computer is they'll start with the what, then move to the how, then move to the why. So they'll say, you know, we have a fast computer and it's, it's uh, well designed and it's got more memory than the competition, it's got a lower price than the competition. The way that we achieve that is by investing the most in R&D and, and, and hiring the best engineers, the best designers, and the why is because we want to build the best products for you, want to buy one. But the way that Apple sells a computer is totally different. Instead of being from the outside in, they go from the inside out. They say, we believe that computing should be easy and simple. We believe that technology should fade into your everyday life, that should be effortless, that you should feel empowered by the things you use. How we do this, we hire the best designers, we hire the best engineers. We just happen to make computers want to buy one. Totally flipping the way that they convey information. But this doesn't happen often enough in crypto. Let's take these two examples. A crypto wallet and gateway to blockchain apps. Well, that works if that's what you wanted. If you woke up in the morning and said, today I want a crypto wallet and gateway to blockchain apps. But it doesn't explain why that matters. It doesn't explain what that's fundamentally going to do for users. It then explains later, start exploring blockchain applications in seconds. Discover, collect, and sell extraordinary NFTs. If, that's, if you know that that's what you want, that headline is going to appeal to you. But if you don't, and it doesn't. Let's flip that on its head. Build a home for your community. This is a website that we worked on for the folks at Bonfire, where after talking to creators, they found that that's the thing that they fundamentally wanted. They wanted to build a home, one place that their community could be. The how and the what is create a custom Web3 native home powered by your social token and NFTs. No place like home. Build a custom Web3 native home for your community powered by your social token and NFTs. Starting with the why, moving to the how, and then moving to the what. Instead of leading by saying, Bonfire is a place where you make social tokens. Mango Markets does a great job of this. Long and short, everything. Give the user a feeling of power. Give them a user a feeling of simplicity. Make that argument that everything's all in one place. Then mention the features. Lightning fast, near zero fees, permissionless. They could have led with that, but they didn't. But then once, you have, once you're explaining the, the, the why, fundamentally, and the how, once you're selling that to your users, the next step is to communicate effectively with them. And a concept that I like to introduce is to mind your user's health bar. So for anybody in the room that's ever played Street Fighter or played an RPG, you know that as you keep going through the game, the health bar gradually gets beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. As people uh, continue uh, with more and more effort, right, that health bar goes down. So how do we deal with this in product design? Well, what we do is we throw little power-ups. We throw things that they can gobble up that'll raise that health bar back up and get them to continue to be excited. We communicate to them why they should be excited so they can complete a flow. So let's give you a great example of this. Um, this is Glow Wallet, the Solana wallet, and they do a fantastic job of this. Now, this flow basically is create new wallet. You then goes to the screen where you have a wallet that turns and shifts and falls through space, creating your wallet, verifying your key, backing up to iCloud, and then it just pops into place and says, welcome to your new wallet, informs them about what that is, and then says, let's go, pulls them into the actual wallet UI. Now, hypothetically, those two middle steps could have just not existed at all. When, they, when the user clicked create new wallet, they could be brought directly to this final screen. But they didn't do that at Glow. And the reason they didn't do that is because they wanted to increase the user's health bar. Why? Because the next step after this fourth screen is they've got to click buy, and they've got to go over to MoonPay. They've got to go do KYC. They have to add their credit card. They have to purchase some crypto. They have to then say what speed they want to receive it at. And then it pops into their wallet a few moments later. They know that there's a really, really large amount of friction right after this process. And so in order to make sure that users actually make it through that high friction process, lead with something that gets them excited so that they'll feel incentivized to get through that action down the road. We worked on Drift Protocol as well. And another point is sometimes you can't get users excited. Sometimes your product actually breaks. Sometimes a trade takes too long to go through. Well, instead of, in that case, it sets up this sort of scenario. The user has given you their time. The user has attempted an action. They've understood your UI. They've gone through the process of executing a trade, but then the trade isn't happening. Well, that's why we have toasts like that that say confirming trade. 
to inform users of progress. Because in other words, instead of them doing an action and then receiving nothing in return, we want to immediately reward them, say, hey, hey, we're, we're working on it. Don't worry, don't worry, we've got you, right? Those moments are important to make sure that users never feel that they've given you their time and effort but haven't received anything in return. Another good example of this, this is actually a project called Bloombox that was created at Solana Hacker House in Barcelona um, by three designers on the Airfoil team, uh, Rob McMacken, uh, Max, Max Potze, and uh, DJ Katz. Um, it's called Bloombox for this reason. It's basically a really beautiful box that you can give to people virtually to onboard them into DeFi by giving them crypto virtually. Now you might say, why do I need this? I could just tell them to go download a wallet and then I could ask them for their wallet address and then I could just send them some Solana. The reason that that's needed is because that sets up a situation where the person that you're trying to onboard has to do all the work up front. They've got to download a wallet, they've got to find the wallet address, they've got to send that to you, you've got to send them some crypto, they then have to um, start exploring what applications they can actually use with the crypto that you send them. So you're saying, please do all the work up front and maybe I'll give you something in the future. Bloombox does the opposite. It gives you a really beautiful box that you press a button, it opens and expands, and then you're presented with a crypto. In other words, you are given something first, then you do the effort as a user, rather than you go through all the effort as a user, and then maybe you'll get something in return. Just changing the framing, just adding these, these you know, elements, it, it's what makes the experience really, really engaging for people. And of course, you can throw in some quick things like, give crypto no link to finally get grandma on a DeFi, or perhaps my favorite, um, to pay your anti-crypto roommate. But then once the user is convinced that this is something that's good for them, once they're in the process, it's important that we guide users through the rough journeys, the places where Web3 tech isn't yet as seamless uh, as we want it to be. I love this example because this is actually a screenshot of an app called Cluster. It was a social networking app that's on an iPhone 8. So this is something that we've known how to solve and design for quite a long time. Um, at, when you want to start with a social networking app, there's always this really scary screen. It's the screen where the app tries to access your contacts. And this is a place where a lot of people just churn. They, they get out of the app entirely, they delete the app, they just move on with their life, and they're not engaged as users. There's a very easy solution to that, though. Use address book. Inviting friends is simple when choosing them from the address book on your phone. Otherwise, you'll have to type contact info individually. Now, here's why that moment is so brilliant. It's brilliant because instead of positioning the screen as something scary for users, it does the exact opposite. It gets the users excited. Now you don't have to type in your contact info individually. We're gonna make it easier for you. All you've gotta do is when you get this next screen, this scary little screen that says access your contacts, just click okay and move on. But in Web3, the reality is today, the experience is you just get a MetaMask pop-up on your computer or on your phone and it asks you to sign something. And then users do one of two things. Either they get scared and they say, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm signing, this doesn't really make sense to me, let me just close out of this altogether, and then they never get to use what you build. Or something that I'm actually more worried about, they get used to signing everything. And then one day they sign something they shouldn't and their entire wallet gets pwned and then our industry has to deal with the blowback. That's why these experiences are so important. Preparing users, educating users, um, getting them excited, but also making sure that they don't make mistakes that they would otherwise make. And this brings me to maybe my most important point in the presentation, which is about onboarding. Now, I think that in a lot of Web3 apps today, we've gotten used to just eliminating onboarding flows altogether. Because, of course, we don't need to ask for usernames and password anymore, right? So why would we need an onboarding flow? Why would we need that, I'm going to click sign up, and then I'm going to go through a bunch of screens? Well, the reason is because it's not the shorter the onboarding, the more effective the onboarding flow. Onboarding flows are more than just collecting information. Onboarding flows are what allow users to understand what it is that you're building, understand how the application works. You can collect valuable information from them to make that experience better. Onboarding is a journey. Your landing page attracts the user, but most users only stay on landing pages for four to five seconds before making uh, a decision in their mind of whether or not to proceed or not. So if they make the decision to actually use your application, then jump into the application and the application doesn't work, 
or doesn't provide them with context or support, then they're never going to make it all the way to the end of the flow. Mango Markets is a good example of how to do this well. It first asks you your language, but then mentions all the reasons that you should care about Mango, because frankly, they know that you didn't read the landing page in the first place. Cross-collateralized leverage trading, all assets count as collateral. Deposit any asset, earn interest automatically. Borrow against your assets. And then, after that flow, Mango brings you into the application itself. Because your users shouldn't need a map to navigate your application. They should be prepared when they get in, and good onboarding flows help us give users those experiences. The status quo of crypto today is a lot of this. You get to your in finance and you see total net worth zero, vaults earning zero, vaults estimated yearly yield zero. At the bottom of the screen there it says wallet not connected, but at no point does it tell you that in order to use your you have to connect a wallet. And so this is where users end up going. They go to YouTube, they read tutorials, they, they read explainers made by other people. That works for the users we have today in crypto, the people who are enthusiasts, who are amped up about the future that we're trying to build, but it doesn't work for the new people because they don't have as high intent to go and search YouTube for explainers on how to use the thing they clicked on. They want the product to tell them how to use the thing that they clicked on. Up here on the screen, where would you go if you entered Curve for the first time and wanted to know more about how it works? You'd have to go all the way up here into the top right corner where there's a little question mark, and that's where all the guides are. So it shouldn't be a surprise that people get to this, say crypto isn't for them, and move on. Orca, welcome to Orca. First time here, read our launch blog post or check out the setup guide to start trading. In other words, you have to know to click the setup guide between those two options at the top and not close the dialog, and then you're brought to a Git book where you can choose between many different options for things to read. Most users drop off at this phase in the onboarding flow. Many more examples of that, but once again, we're asking users to give us their time, their energy, their attention, but then not giving them any payoff in return. So now I want to get to conversion because, okay, let's say that we have gotten users really, really excited. We've gotten them to try our application. Now, Let's make sure that when they get to the home screen itself, they understand how to continue successfully using the application. And the best way to do that is to always keep the user focused on one thing per page. Now, this is a tricky one to implement in what you're building, but it's an important one. And I thought a really great example to give would actually be Coinbase. After all, there's a lot of information that Coinbase needs to convey here. It needs to show you your portfolio balance, your assets. It has to lead you to other parts of the application to earn interest, make recurring buys. And of course, it has to have the entire navigation menu. But there's only one thing on this page that they're actually drawing attention to. And that's the blue button up there, buy and sell. Now, they could have made send and receive blue. They could have added another blue button somewhere else in the interface, but they didn't. And they didn't because when you use the same styling to refer to multiple elements, you sort of confuse users. Their attention goes over here, then it goes over here. Coinbase wants your attention, if you're a new user, to go to only one place, buy and sell. Because if you buy and sell, then everything else in the application is actually useful to you. But if you don't have any crypto in your account, trade doesn't do anything for you, pay doesn't do anything for you, notifications, there'll be no notifications. So you, the rest of your experience won't be as good as it could be. Rainbow does a great job of this too. Every single one of these screens has one, if at most two, elements that they're trying to draw your attention to. Add cash, send money, select from a pre-existing wallet, um, enter an amount. And the reason they're steering your, um, your attention in that way is because they know that if you lose your attention, if instead of looking down there at send, you start looking up there at um, scan, when you, you're not already ready to scan something, that you're not gonna be able to successfully complete the flow. So I'm gonna give you an example of this in action. Now the first time that I gave this talk, um, it was at the Solana Hacker House about a year ago, and we talked about some issues with the Solana name service, which is the way that you get a .sol domain name. And uh, funny enough, Bonfita actually saw it, and then reached out to me over email, and then said um, that they'd be interested in reevaluating it and, and finding ways to make the process better. So I want to show you what it was before we started working on it and then a little bit after. This is what it used to look like. I'm sure some people in this room remember this. Unique domains on Solana, simplified transferring of funds, de de developing projects and more. Again, it's going back to what I talked about at the beginning of the presentation. It's emphasizing the what, saying this is a place where you can get unique domains but not explaining why you would want to get 
unique domains. From there, it shows you other domains people got, but doesn't drive your attention to one thing. Each of these UI elements have about equal prominence. Search domain names and ending soon look very similar. If we really were to ask, what are the things that people are gonna pay attention to on this page? They're gonna pay attention to the names. But if we see the onboarding flow as, we want users to go get their own domain name, where on this page does it actually encourage users to get their own domain name? Then they have to go through a series of steps that don't handhold the user, that don't explain to them what's going on and why they should care, including one step that says, what space do you need, and then doesn't explain what that means. So here's what we did. Your humanized ID for the metaverse. Start dot soul searching. You search for a name, and then you're presented with the name you've searched for with a big button that says add to cart so that you can add it to your cart and proceed. But then we remind you why you should get a .soul domain. Quickly send and receive funds to human readable address, collect and exchange .soul names directly or as NFTs, host projects with your unique and exotic domain name. We're constantly reminding the users, because we know that they're not reading that whole landing page, why they should continue to invest their time in the Solana name service as a product. Then we invite them to place a bid. We don't lose where they are. We fade out the background so that they feel like they're still in the same place, but we don't distract them with other things that they've already answered. And then we reward the user with a success state that is a nice green check mark to thank them for giving us their time and their attention. So I covered a lot of stuff across this presentation, a lot of different tactics and strategies that you can use in your applications today. But I wanna tie it back to kind of one core idea. We need to expect not that users will do the work for us, but that we should do the work for them. Understand where they're coming from, understand what they think as they're moving through the applications that we're building, and create experiences that feel seamless and easy to use for people. Crypto exists to make the world not just a better place, but an easier place. Whether it's sending money, whether it's earning online credentials, whether it's joining online communities, so we need to do our part to make sure that it actually is easier for our users. And I think we need to put some focus on some of the stuff I talked about today. So we're gonna cross the Q&A, but I just wanted to say thank you everybody so much for having me. And um, I'll be around afterwards, happy to talk with anybody um, if we can be of help uh, in what you're building. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Bill, for your interesting sharing.